Um, and, and congratulations, all of us for <laughs> um, the elections finally being over and uh, Trump finally being, I don't know, not out yet, he might have to be kicked, um, kicked out, uh, kicking and screaming or whatever, but, um, but it's good. Um, and obviously, you know, it's, it's not, it's not over. Um, not only in, in the sense that he's not out of office yet, but all of the things that have created Trump and Trumpism uh, are, are still in place. And that's why uh, the struggle goes on. And that's why having um, socialist and Marxist politics, I think is so critical. Um, so I'm glad to be having this conversation today. It's a good time to have it. Um, and, um, and like I said, it's nice to get to be with the central Jersey folks, um, where I spent a bunch of years myself. Um, so, so yeah, um, I, I wrote this book, A People's Guide to Capitalism. Hopefully some of you have gotten a chance to check it out. Um, but my, my purpose in, in writing it, um, is that I really believe very strongly that questions about how our system works and therefore how the economy works really have to be, uh, in the hands of, you know, regular people like, like us, um, that we can't leave it up to the so-called experts that in order for us to make demands on the system, make changes and ultimately overturn the way that the economy works, we have to be able to understand it, right? Um, there's no other situation where you would willingly like enter into a battle without having an understanding of who your opponent is or, or what they are or, or, or what have you. Um, in the same way that like sports teams like watch each other's games and you know learn about each other's plays and strengths and weaknesses, um, you know we're we're obviously up against capitalism, which is not just like another sports team, unfortunately, um, and we're not meeting on a level playing field. We have, you know, a system that's entrenched and that has powerful interests um, that's backed, of course, by unprecedented amount of wealth um, and 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 armed and so on. And you know we have our own powers too, which I'll talk a little bit about at the end, but, um, but, but the fact that the system is so entrenched and, and uh, include, has so much power uh, and wealth behind it is all the more reason why we really need to understand that system. Um, what makes it ticks, what are its contradictions, uh, the points of weakness, et cetera. Um, and the idea that the economy is just too hard to understand, I think really benefits the status quo. Um, so I think it's not a coincidence that uh, we're told in a million different ways throughout our lives that trying to understand it is just not up to us. And that's uh, why I wrote the book. And that's why I'm committed to participating in as many of these kind of discussions as possible. Um, I think we're at a really important moment when, you know, everything in our society is being exposed um, and scrutinized and challenged. Uh, and people, thousands of people are flocking to socialist organizations and particularly DSA. I forgot to mention in the introduction that I, I am also a member of DSA in um, central Brooklyn. Um, but I think, you know, there's this broader awareness right now in society about profits, about uh, who benefits at whose expense. You know, we're seeing billionaires right now increase their wealth by billions more during a pandemic, while literally 8 million people have fallen into poverty just since May in the United States. Um, so, you know, I think the, the moment that, the, you know, it is, is really an important one to be able to go from kind of these broad socialist instincts and aims, uh, which are resonating with, with increasing numbers of people to really deepen and develop the kind of analysis that we need to understand the structures of what we're up against. And I think in order to do that, that really Marxism is the best tool uh, that we have. Um, so, so Marxism, you know, explains capitalism as a system, right? It's not just a collection of individuals that some of are greedier and nastier than others, uh, but it's a system, it's a social structure made up of classes that have different material interests and they operate based on those different material interests. Um, in the book, I go through a little bit about how it is that class society arose and specifically uh, cap the capitalist form of class society. Uh, and I'm you know, not gonna get into that right now, but I think that the main point that I wanna underline about it is that it's not just like a natural human state of affairs that we're just 
organized into this rigid hierarchy. Um, but it's actually a historical moment that we're in. And um, in the book, I use the example that if you were to compress all of human history into a single day, into a 24 hour period, then capitalism would take up the last three minutes of those 24 hours. Um, it's actually a tiny part of human history. Obviously, when you're in the middle of it, it doesn't feel like a tiny part. Um, but I think that the, the, the important thing is that it's not like class hierarchies are just built into our DNA, um, but there's, there's structures um, that we have in, you know, in place because of um, historical conditions and um, they're, they're, they're man-made and they, they have a beginning and they can have an end. Um, so what makes capitalism capitalism? What makes it tick is a ceaseless growth of value. Um, Marx defined capital as like a self-expanding value. And I want to unpack that for a second. Um, and I actually will share my screen for just a moment, if I can figure out how to do that. Uh, share screen. Okay, did that work? Not yet. I feel like I should be better at this by now in the Zoom era. Um, but so basically Marx summed up all of capitalism in this, what he called the circuit of capital, this equation M to C to M with a little doohickey next to it, technically called M prime. Um, so you have money, M is money. It gets invested into C, which is commodities. And then those commodities are sold for M with a doohickey, more money. Um, so M to C to M prime. Um, and that's basically the, um, the circuit of of capitalism in a nutshell. Um, so so the, the, all of capitalism basically is um, summed up in that little doohickey at the end of the equation. Um, the, the, the need for more money, the, um, uh, the um, what's the word I'm looking for? The, the, the process of getting more money, uh, that's capitalism in a nutshell. Uh, now, the way Marx put it, as he said, it would be like absurd and empty for capitalists to just invest money in order to produce commodities in order to sell it for the same amount of money. Um, they, they wouldn't do that. Um, and um, in fact, that's what happens in an in a economic crisis is that capitalism just sit on, as capitalists just sit on their money rather than invest it if they don't think that they can get more money at the end of the process. Um, so, so the question is, you know, what, where does that more money come from? Where is that added value? Um, so the, the first thing that Marx does is he talks about like, well, what is value exactly? Because under capitalism, it means a very specific kind of thing. And it's not, um, you know, we assign values under capitalism, not based on how useful they are. Cause uh, you know, if that was the case then obviously things like water or bread would be a lot more valuable than diamonds. Um, so how, how do we understand value under capitalism? So Marx split the concept of value into two things. He called a commodities use value, what is what you use it for. So like a chair is, um, you know, that you sit on it, that's its use value. Um, and its exchange value is what it exchanges for relative to other commodities. Um, and that's measured, you know, by money. Um, and and I, I will just mention, and um, you know, we can talk more about it in the discussion, and I, I talk more about it in the book, but I'll just flag it here that what Marx means by that kind of exchange value where you measure you know, the worth of a chair, for instance, compared to the worth of a car, um, that um, it's, not the same, it's not synonymous with price because prices can fluctuate wildly um, or you know, even when a base value doesn't change. Um, but it's an, it's an important to, um, um, so it, it's not exactly the same thing, um, but it's an important starting point, right? That no matter how much prices fluctuate, a wooden chair is never gonna cost more than a car um, because um, they have different kind of base values. So what determines that value? Um, the value around which things um, exchange in relation to each other is how much labor has gone into producing them. And that's uh, what is known as the labor theory of value, um, which is something that's generally attributed to Marx, but Marx didn't come up with that concept. 
Um, a lot of, most of the classical economists from Adam Smith to David Ricardo talked about the labor theory of value in some form or fashion. It was sort of considered a given at the time. Um, and Marx expanded a lot on it and built um, a whole framework around it. Um, but the basic idea, right, is that the amount of labor time that it takes to produce something is what determines its value. So the exchange value of a chair is determined by how long it takes to make it, including how long it takes to make the various inputs, the finished wood, the machinery, and so on. Um, so like in a very oversimplified example, if it takes a thousand times longer to make a car than it does to make a chair, then the car will be roughly worth a thousand times greater than the chair. Um, like I said, prices are a lot more complicated than that, but it's a good starting point for understanding the basic kind of driving force of value under capitalism. That value isn't something that's just naturally imbued in a commodity. It's not like diamonds are just so shiny and pretty that they automatically just cost a lot of money uh, because of their inherent qualities. Uh, but their value is socially determined uh, by how much labor time is necessary to produce a commodity in a given place at a given time with a given amount of kind of technological know-how that we have. Um, and that's why something like computers, for instance, like in the 1970s, they were these like huge and clunky uh, machines that weren't that powerful, uh, but they cost thousands of dollars um, in the 70s because they just, the technology wasn't there to make them uh, easily and quickly. So it was a luxury item. Now we have a technology, you know, necessary to make much more powerful computers much more quickly. So you can get like, you know, a computer for $300. It's much more powerful than uh, anything that the 1970s computers could have done. So that's just like an example of how, you know, what is it that drives the whole um, uh, concept of value under capitalism? So the point of capitalism, I said, for capitalists at least, is to increase the value that they start with by producing more value to make a profit. Um, the standard conventional wisdom, right, is that profit is produced through the cunning of the market. Um, capitalists have like a bright idea, a mission to Mars or a pretty iPhone or what have you, and they know how to market it. Um, and, um, you know, they know how to buy cheap and sell dear, et cetera, and they can uh, make money along the way. Um, but the reality is that while, yes, there's, you know, some marketing genius involved in getting us all addicted to iPhones, um, that doesn't explain why, you know, both, you know, even if uh, iPhones uh, have been marketed better than like say Androids or whatever, it doesn't explain why both of those companies are able to increase their wealth tremendously over time. Um, and this is where Marx talked about the sort of seemingly magical goose of capitalism that lays golden eggs. Um, the extra value doesn't come from the marketplace, but out of a production process that creates more value than it begins with. Um, and the secret hidden within that production process, the magical goose of capitalism is actually us. <laughs> um, it's the secret commodity of labor power, our ability to work. Um, so basically under capitalism, the ability to work has become a commodity which capitalists buy from us in exchange for a wage. So you could say that the exchange value of uh, our labor power is measured in a wage uh, that's how much labor power is bought and sold for. Um, but the tricky part is, um, is that the exchange value of labor power is paid out in a wage, but the use value of labor, what, you know, what labor power is used for is to create new value. Um, and that goes back to what I was just referring to as the labor theory of value. What gives things value, uh, what imbues new value in, you know, commodities uh, is that labor time has gone into producing them. And the heart of understanding where profits come from is distinguishing between, you know, labor's exchange value, our wage, and labor's use value, our ability to create new value uh, with, with our labor power. So, you know, as workers, we're paid one thing in wages, but then we normally create much more value during uh, our work shifts. Um, we enter into an arrangement with bosses where they own our time uh, and our ability to labor during that time and what we produce for them, even if it's much more than what they paid us in the wage is theirs to keep. They've, you know, they've paid us a wage, but they own the products of our labor. Um, so the, the example that I use in my book um, is at Starbucks, just because it's a kind of simple, straightforward 
example, but let's say they pay you $120 for an eight hour shift, but you can make $120 worth of fancy coffee drinks, you know, typically in an hour. Um, but you can't throw down your apron after an hour and say, well, fair is fair. I made back the money you paid me. Um, I'm going home. Um, your labor is theirs for the next seven hours. Um, and for the rest of your shift, you're basically working for free. And that extra value produced during this stolen time is what Marx called surplus value. Uh, and that's uh, at the heart of where uh, capitalist profits come from. Um, so, so this arrangement, um, this very unfair arrangement brings us back to the concept of capitalism as a social structure made up of classes that have different material interests. Uh, we have one class, the capitalists, that because they own the stores and the machinery and the software and the capital uh, needed to produce what Marx called the means of production, uh, can buy our labor power and put it to use for making more value for themselves. Um, and then another class, uh, the working class, which really only has one main commodity that we could sell, which is our labor power. Um, you know, you might have like random shit you could sell on eBay or maybe make something um, that you sell on Etsy, but those things are negligible to the way that the system produces the vast majority of goods and wealth um, in our society. Um, so that's, you know, the basic Marxist definition of class, right? Anyone who holds economic control uh, at the workplace that dictates the terms of others' working conditions, that owns capital that can be invested in that M to C to M uh, circuit that I described, uh, is part of the capitalist class. And anyone that has to sell their ability to work for a wage and has uh, no access to the ability to produce um, our own life's necessities for ourselves is part of the working class. Um, and there is like a middle class in between made up of managers, um, and some uh, professionals that have a bunch of, um, um, you know, say so at their at their workplace. Um, but the main drivers of capitalism are uh, bosses and workers. Um, so, so we talked a little bit about right the exploitative relationship between capitalists and workers, um, and you can see how these two classes would have opposite interests. You know, one wants to squeeze as much value out of the other as possible. The other wants to have better work conditions, more breaks, less speed ups, uh, a demand to a greater share of the value uh, of what we've produced. But there's also an important relationship between capitalists that I wanna draw out for just a minute, um, which is one of competition because that really, um, you know, the drive for profit is sort of like the, the lifeblood of, of capitalism. Um, and, but competition is kind of like the beating heart. That's what makes it, um, you know, uh, a pump is the competition between capitalists uh, to make sure that, you know, whatever um, value they've, they've uh, extracted through the process of production then has to be realized. Somebody actually has to buy those goods. Um, so for instance, like Starbucks does an incredibly um, efficient job of exploiting their workers uh, but they're also planning on closing 400 stores this year so far uh, because there's just less people out there buying fancy coffee drinks. So you, it's not enough to engage in the process of exploitation. You have to uh, realize that value in, in the marketplace. So there's, you know, simultaneous to the battle that's taking place within the workplace around our terms of our exploitation is a battle between capitalists, right? Um, if each capitalist just had their own market, um, then it would be pretty simple. All they would need to do is, you know, put that nifty magical goose uh, that lays golden eggs to work, produce commodities, sell them on, on the market, and boom, you know, they get profits. Um, but the problem for the capitalists is that between each of those dashes, like between the M to the C to the M with a doohickey, um, are question marks, um, whether they can turn that money into commodities and turn those commodities into more money. Um, is, is uh, a question for capitalists. Are they gonna find, uh, for instance, the necessary buyers to buy their goods? Um, and for this, they have to engage in a competitive struggle with other capitalists. 
Um, and this is the part where if there is, you know, if you could make a case for there being marketing genius, et cetera, that's where it would come in, right? Um, but even, even there, it still plays a relatively small part because the reality is that, you know, companies like Samsung, which produce Android phones, um, have been able to produce phones more cheaply um, and that's gotten them a greater market share than Apple. Um, and that's ultimately kind of more important than, than marketing. And this is something that Apple also engages in, right? Is how to um, constantly make their goods faster and cheaper uh, in order to be the ones that can sell their goods and get a greater market share. Um, so like at minimum, right? Each company has to sell their items at or below the price that everyone else is selling their, their items for. If you, if most of your competitors are making like a hundred trinkets in an hour and you can make them in a half an hour, then you're ahead of the game. Your labor costs are down, you can sell them for cheaper and you can undercut your competitors. Um, but if the reverse is true, if everyone's selling them in a half an hour and you're still using the old trinket making machinery that um, churns them out in a hundred in an hour, then you're gonna be spending twice as much money on labor costs uh, to produce the same amount of goods. And you'll either have to charge more to make up for that and lose buyers, or you'll charge what everyone else is charging and you operate at a loss. Uh, and either way, um, you're at risk of going out of business. And that's why um, there is this constant um, uh, competitive imperative under capitalism um, to, to produce uh, more and more cheaply. Um, and this, you know, is mostly done by reducing the cost of labor, which could either be done by cutting our wages and benefits or by introducing labor saving technologies, um, which means that workers can produce more goods in less time. Um, so, so companies um, need to make uh, profits um, and they can invest those profits um, in the most advanced technologies to produce goods faster and more efficiently. Um, and, they, and they have to do that. You know, it's not just the case that um, each company just wants to be more profitable in order to get a greater market share. Um, and it's, it's that those profits have to be invested into um, constantly updating technology and constantly being ahead of the curve or at least keeping up with the curve um, in terms of uh, the time that it produces to make things. And in, in, the, in the best case scenario, the like, you know, the, the positive element of that um, is that that does help to drive technological innovation. Um, th I think there are a lot of limits to that positive um, aspect of things, which we can talk more about in discussion. But I think, you know, more importantly is that the, the ugly underside of this competition is that it means that workers uh, are driven to continue to produce a profit at any cost, um, you know, to reopen meat, park, meat, meat packing factories, for instance, in the midst of a pandemic and completely unsafe conditions, um, or to send teachers back to work in these, you know, COVID petri dishes that we have um, in the school system right now, because parents are needed at their jobs to keep profits churning, um, that that is what um, happens because of a ceaseless um, need to compete. Um, so, so capitalism then is like in a nutshell, right, is primarily concerned with producing value, um, not in the sense of what's actually valuable to human beings, uh, but in the sense of what can be sold and for how much. Um, and we saw that, you know, st are still seeing that um, in, in very stark, um, you know, detail right now during the pandemic where eight months into the pandemic, there still aren't enough uh, N95 masks, for instance. Um, you know, it's capitalism, what the market knows best is to sell those masks as by, for as much as possible. The, the prices of masks um, were like seven times what they are normally um, during the pandemic. Um, you know, but the system can't be organized in order to just produce what's really needed uh, right now. It's, it's, it's uh, organized around what can be sold and for how much. Um, and, and it's a system that produces that value through the exploitation of workers uh, for the benefit of the capitalists. Um, and then those capitalists are then pitted in a death match with each other to gain 
market share um, and workers are made to pay the price for that death match because whoever goes out of business, um, it's, the, it's the workers of that business um, that ultimately have to pay the price for it. Um, so that's kind of a, a bare bones uh, explanation of capitalism in a nutshell. Um, and, um, and, and the, but the good news within that, and maybe this is something we can also talk about more in discussion, is that inherent to, in, inherent to this profit system is what Marx called the system's grave diggers, uh, the working class. Because be, if profit is the central thing that makes a system works, stopping profits is also you know, the, the central thing that can stop capitalism. Um, and that's ultimately where our power lies. Um, and in fact, you know, the whole discussion during the last few months of essential workers uh, during this pandemic is an admission of that fact, right? That, you know, it may be the Jeff Bezos of the world that are increasing their wealth by billions of dollars during this pandemic, but it's actually Amazon workers that are central to um, doing, do, you know, getting us, you know, goods, packing up, um, shipping, driving, delivering, um, all those things, obviously, nurses, teachers, etc. that like the people that actually make the system run and continue to churn are the our workers. Um, and so that that also is, you know, then points to where it is that we have our power, um, where we're collectively organized into workplaces, um, and, and have the potential to organize there. Um, where where we hold that power. Um, so that's hopefully, you know, a starting point for, for a discussion where we can dig a little deeper into the details of how all that works, uh, what that means for us today, et cetera. Thank you so much. That was really awesome. Um, yeah, so just some, uh, just first instructions for everyone. I know we have um, a lot of excitement about digging deeper into this. Um, just, uh, just some rules here, kind of, like, if you do want to speak of just for the sake of the thing that we believe in, step up, step back, we try to make a space for folks, for everyone to feel comfortable. Again, you can comment straight in the chat if you wanted a question or anything. Um, but if you want to speak up, just type in stack like this. And then um, Hadas, if you don't mind like picking on folks, you can go ahead and pick on folks if there's someone who said stack. Um, and then if you have comments, you want to still say something, but you don't feel as comfortable speaking up, just do it in the chat. Um, and try to try to limit what you're trying to say to like about two minutes or so, because we want to make sure everyone gets a chance to ask questions and to discuss. Um, so with that, yeah, so I guess, yeah, discussion is open. Okay, I see Sarah wrote, would love to hear more about the racialized nature of capitalism. Um, did you want to say anything more about that or just that, or just leave it at that question? Well, do you want uh, folks to have several questions and then you to answer, or do you want to do a one to one? Whatever is good for you guys. If you want to throw a bunch of questions out there, that would be great. Um, it's up to you. Um, Jessica asked ties into paternalism. I guess these are the first two maybe to talk about more. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so um, I guess one I'll say a few things. One, one general thing to start with is just that um, capitalism needs oppression in order to stay in place. Um, that it's not, um, you know, for, for all the reasons that I laid out, the fact that you have a tiny minority at the top of society that, um, you know, gets to control and to wield uh, all of the wealth that the majority of us have made um, and, uh, and for their own gain. Um, and, you know, under, 
the kind of conditions that we're seeing certainly right now during the pandemic, but that's sort of like the, the most extreme um, visible uh, version of that, but that is what, uh, what happens day in and day out, um, you know, that our lives literally don't matter to them. Um, that in order to keep up that kind of a system um, where the vast majority of people, the, the vast majority of people don't benefit from uh, the most effective way uh, to do that is for that majority of people to be divided amongst ourselves, right? Um, and so that's one one thing that I want to say in general before um, taking up those specific questions is that is that oppression so much of um, so many different types of oppression um, are completely inherent to the way that capitalism. Uh, functions and in order to maintain the status quo. Um, so of course, all the specific, specific forms of oppression um, all play out in, in a lot of different ways and take on a life of their own um, that isn't just, um, uh, that can't just be boiled down to economic exploitation, obviously. Um, there's an economic component to all of it. Um, you know, for instance, if you look at just the rates of exploitation and, um, you know, um, women making 76 cents to the man's dollar, um, just how many, if, you know, if you look at any of the charts, right, of like how unemployment has impacted different uh, stratums of our society, um, you know, it's just, um, I could, I, if I can find the, a chart a little, in a little bit, I could share it on the screen, but um, it's just wildly disproportionate, right? Um, and capitalism depends on having, you know, um, sections of the population that are um, more oppressed, more vulnerable, and more desperate um, in order to have, you know, a, a, a even more super exploited uh, sections of the population. Um, so there is an economic component to all of that, um, but it, but it is also the case that. Um, these oppressions take on a life of their own. So, you know, uh, racism in the United States is really, um, has been the central tool of the ruling class um, since the, the, the founding of this country, right? That this, this country was founded on slavery, um, that the um, accumulation of capital um, at the, at, from the get-go was based on um, you know, slave labor, the amount of um, cotton um, and the, um, the initial trade, et cetera, that helped to found the economic um, power of this country um, was built on the, 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 the backs of slaves. Um, all sorts of things flow from there that, you know, I, um, I, I can't really hope to get into in, in, in a few minutes and that I don't um, really have even in the book, like have a, you know, there, there's tons of books that we can kind of recommend that go and dive into that more deeply. Um, but the way that then um, capitalism um, has depended on racism has evolved and mutated over time, right? Um, so you had the like um, slave catching, um, you know, and uh, vigilantes and KKK and all of that, um, that then develop into um, we still have obviously white supremacist vigilantes, but also the police force, um, you know, had uh, has ties to that history as well. Um, the the war on drugs, the scapegoating um, of entire uh, populations and you know black and brown populations, um, that really is the like ideological like glue of um, of of capitalism. Um, so. Um, yeah, I will say that, um, you know, I think the sexism um, and um, the, the domination of women has its own history as well. Um, and I, again, I don't have, um, you know, it's not something I can kind of do justice to in, in a few minutes, but I will just say that um, one of the elements of, um, of sexism um, that is so central to capitalism um, and is something that uh, Marxist feminists talk a lot about 
is a concept of social reproduction that you know the system can't function without profits being made at the point of production but it also can't function um, without a lot of unpaid work being done outside of um, the domain of production um, that in order to have um, our commodity of labor power, right? Our ability to work in order for that to be produced and reproduced and be able to go back to work day in and day out. Um, a lot of work has to happen um, to both to raise those people that become workers um, and then to continue to keep us all um, fed and clothed and, um, and, and et cetera. Um, and that, you know, I, I, I recently wrote an article for Jacobin about um, parenting um, uh, but that says, you know, parenting is a job. Um, it's just an unpaid job, but it's a job that capitalism depends on. Um, and, you know, in fact, I can't remember, I think it was a New York Times had this, um, this article a few months back that if, if all of the, a, a pretty conservative estimate, honestly, of the amount of work that women do, uh, because it does disproportionately still fall on women, um, the amount of work that women do on basic household maintenance, um, child rearing, um, et cetera, was paid a minimum wage, then if you add all of that together across the country, every year that would be worth $1.5 trillion worth of labor. Um, and that's at a minimum wage. So. Um, Anyway, so th th that just gives you a little glimpse of um, the ways that uh, capitalism depends on, on at least a couple of these forms of, of oppression, but there's, uh, there's a lot more to be said about, about both. Jessica, that was great. Thank you so much. And I, yeah, definitely um, there's some recommendations. I also plugged uh, your article in the chat so people if you want to read that. We did talk about SRT a while ago in pandemic times. I think Tiki Bhattacharya's work is also really good. And um, I, can't for, I forgot the other person's name we've read, but we've also had some of our members lead discussions on abolishing the nuclear family and then connecting that to that theory and things of that nature. Um, so I think I saw Jessica, um, you were on stack. Do you want to go next? Sure, I'd be glad to. Um, thank you, like this has been really good. Um, I wanted to talk to a little bit more. I, I had posted about um, paternalism, but I'm also thinking about the identity politics that are tied into capitalism and that, you know, part of um, the pro sort of Trump base and that has a lot to do with, of course, white men and their identities that are wrapped into capitalism. And um, I mean, I know folks today, right, who, who capital, like their, their accumulation of wealth, right, is directly tied into their identity. And this is so hard for them to shake, particularly folks who I think have grown up uh, feeling like they've had less, right? And in and, and this meritocracy, feel like they've earned and that their value, their value, their identity, everything that, that makes them what they are today is tied into this accumulation of wealth and capital. And I'm just kind of curious about like um, your thoughts on that and like what, you, what you've even seen and like how it affects I mean, even even the election, right? It affects everything that we do, and that's I'm particularly interested in these in these uh, gender sort of things. But thank you for mentioning the unpaid labor. I love I love that that you brought that up because yeah, capital, like our system relies very heavily, right, on the unpaid work of women and of the schools as childcare and of a million other things. But I'm really interested in sort of these identity politics that I think I think honestly sometimes I think that's the hugest block, right, to moving forward. So I'm just curious on your thoughts. Yeah, I think that's that's a great um, question, and it's complicated. Um, and I I I'm looking forward to um, there being more data and information coming out of the elections. Um, you know, I think it's um, there's certainly a lot of truth to that, and it's also a like complicated picture. Um, you know, where obviously people have been reporting um, during this last election that. Trump managed to increase his um, um, share of Latino votes quite significantly. In fact, he increased his share of votes among almost every constituency except for white men, um, which is interesting. Um, so, you know, I so I think that there's there's more going on 
um, than just people's identity. I think obviously he does play to that. Um, he, he consciously stokes obviously racism and misogyny um, and he consciously stokes um, you know, the, the bitterness that you're talking about among um, you know, basically sections of the population that uh, feel like they haven't gotten their just desserts um, and you know, probably sections of the population, at least some sections of the population that um, are, have been suffering. Um, and the fact is, is that there hasn't been a compelling argument and, and alternative um, posed about um, where that suffering is coming from. And so Trump can come in and manipulate the bitterness that people feel, uh, in some cases, the suffering that people have gone through um, and um, use the most vile you know, forms of scapegoating um, as an answer to that. Um, and I think in the absence of there being put forward a positive vision and a positive alternative about why things are the way that they are, um, that that has some resonance with people. Um, you know, it's, um, you know, like I, I have been so furious for months about the stimulus uh, negotiations that have completely fallen apart, right? That they had the initial stimulus packages in the spring that have, you know, basically saved people's um, um, asses. Like, I mean, it's just uh, so necessary in, in, a, in an economy that's really bottoming out. Um, and they did some initial, there was a bunch of crap in there too and corporate slush funds, but there were some things in there that were actually, you know, the extended unemployment benefits were, were totally, totally critical um, to uh, the economy uh, falling over the cliff and people being able to maintain some level of, um, of, of normalcy in very abnormal um, times. But those have run out and basically like both parties have been playing chicken ever since, you know, and trying to like, you know, basically playing football with, um, you know, political football with um, economic relief. So anyway, that's a little bit of a tangent, but the, the point that I'm saying is that like, I think for a lot of people, um, you know, they're, they see politicians of both parties as basically going along with a rotten status quo. Um, and, with, and then, you know, Trump um, has been able to, um, to cynically manipulate all of the frustrations um, to, 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 in a very right wing, um, through very right wing uh, means, of course. Um, so um, anyway, I, I think that, I'm sorry if that's a little bit of a tangent, but I think um, my point being that yes, there has, there, there is, um, you know, consciously um, racist and white supremacist um, and misogynistic um, elements that are being stoked um, in, in the most, you know, and, and, and Trump's entire political strategy is based on these quote unquote culture wars. Um, at the same time that there's also, um, I think it behooves us to kind of look beneath the surface around those questions as well about what is, sto what, what is driving all of those, um, you know, frustrations and bitterness to begin with that can be manipulated in the way that they have been. I don't know if that totally answers it or if you want to, if there's anything else I should say there. Yeah, if anyone wants to speak up, just type in stack or put in the chat box. Oh, wow, that's a really good question. We need to a less capitalist society. Um, Do you, uh, do you want to answer that one right now? I can try. I don't have a very good answer, to be honest. Um, if I, I, yeah, I think um, that's the million dollar question. I, 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 I would say a couple things. Um, one is that um, there are certainly in terms of like moving towards a, a different um, 
you know, towards a less capitalist society. Um, you know, some of that you could is gradual in the sense that we can fight for reforms that um, that would will really matter. Um, that will that could take some of the worst edge off of um, exploitation and oppression, and that we really need to fight like hell for. Um, and um, um, you know, those those are the fact that even um, kind of the, the most bare minimum of reforms are so hard to fight for it gives you some indication of how much they um, do cut into the interests of the capitalist class. Um, you know, the, the fact that we're, we're still fighting for a $15 minimum wage um, is insane. I mean, it's like if, if the minimum wage had kept up with inflation, um, it would be way higher than that. Or the, you know, the fact that like the 400 richest billionaires um, in the country have increased their wealth by almost $300 billion during the pandemic alone. Um, and that we can't get up to a $15 minimum wage is insane. Um, so, you know, the fact that uh, nobody in either mainstream political part, in, in the mainstream of either political parties is willing to uh, entertain Medicare for all and us having a national healthcare system um, is insane, you know? Um, these are very basic bare minimum reforms um, that I think we need to uh, continue to fight like hell for and that will improve our lives. And they, and they do at the same time contradict the interests of capitalists. And that goes back to this whole point about like, we have opposing interests, right? It's not that we just have to make more compelling arguments. I mean, the majority of people in the US are in favor of um, Medicare for all and a national healthcare system. Um, the, all the arguments that people like Bernie Sanders put out about why it's a, actually a better system and why um, you know, it would get us healthcare and more cheaply. Um, and, and uh, you know, those, they, they know that, you know, th this is not a question of having the right arguments um, or having um, the, the, uh, the, the right amount of people, um, regular people to agree. This is, the, this is a, a question of, um, you know, an entrenched um, for-profit industry that is not gonna go away without a huge fight. And, you know, the same thing goes obviously for like the oil industry and like the oil industry, I mean, they're like, their profits have totally cratered. Um, it would be so easy to actually buy up the oil industry to nationalize it. It's actually not worth that much money right now. Um, and to um, basically draw down um, oil production, um, train that workforce, um, and, and, and retrain and, and rehire that workforce in, in, different, in a different capacity. Uh, these things are, are absolutely possible, um, but the, the, we're up against entrenched industries. Um, so, so, the, so part of the answer is, right, we need to, uh, in order to move away from capitalism, we need to fight like hell for these reforms. Um, and then the other part of the, question, the, the equation is, the fact that we have to fight like hell for really kind of basic reforms and um, you know for the life of the planet, et cetera, gives you some indication that something more radical has to take place um, and, and that where we've won reforms are actually constantly being taken away from us um, unless we're still in the process of fighting for them. It's like a perpetual ongoing constant fight. Um, and so in, in order to, um, um, ultimately move away from capitalism, we have to do more than move away from it. I think ultimately we have to overthrow it. Um, and that, you know, how we, how we get to that and how we organize, um, you know, and what kind of role organizations like DSA um, and, and other parts of the left play in that, I think um, is a whole other discussion. But I think, um, you know, that, that kind of has to be the starting point that like we need to fight like hell um, for reforms, for the sustainability of this planet, for our um, health and, and lives. Um, and, but we also have to connect that to a longer term struggle to actually overturn the way that um, this economy is set up for, for, um, you know, for, the, uh, for the few at the expense of the many. Yeah, if I, I'm gonna cheat a little bit. 
by not playing stack, I guess. But like, I was also really interested. I mean, you mentioned this sort of in the beginning of the book, but I was interested to also maybe, um, if you don't mind, talking a little bit more about the motivation behind writing a People's Guide to Capitalism. Um, you know, like I, I mean, there's a lot said about capital, but like for me personally, I was like looking for a book like this. Um, in terms of being like, it's really not that long. It has like really like you, you showed in an instance, like has really interesting graphs that are accessible. Um, I was wondering if that maybe is a reason, but yeah, if you don't mind talking a little bit about the motivation behind writing the book and then the two for, unfortunately it's like a different question also that I can wait, but um, it's just like, if you don't mind also adding to a little bit of like the current kind of form of capital we're living under, like with the financialization, because you, you mentioned in the book, like it's always been there. It isn't necessarily unique unique it, they always had banks and these things but but as you also said in the book there is a difference though in some ways about what's happening now um if you don't mind talking about that too the financialization era that we're under uh undergoing or have undergone and are dealing with so yeah those are my two questions great yeah um so my my motivation for writing the book so basically i um you know, I was in uh, another socialist organization for a bunch of years. Um, and I, I don't know how many of you have heard of like the socialism conference that uh, still goes, takes place and DSA has been involved in for the last couple of years has been a really great opportunity for um, lots of people from all over the country and, and activists from around the world as well to get together and actually like spend time hashing out political questions, uh, theoretical, historical, et cetera, contemporary questions. Um, and um, I, I spent, uh, there were a few, quite a few years in a row where I was giving talks um, at that conference specifically about the economy. Um, and my, my goal was, um, and I, I sort of mentioned this in the beginning of this meeting, like my goal was to make it accessible, right? Um, <coughs> I didn't. I have don't come from an academic, economic, academic background. Um, I come from an activist background of wanting to understand how the system works, uh, because if we don't understand how it works, then we can't defeat it. Um, and I spent a bunch of time personally trying to read economic writing, to read Marxist economic writing, to read Marx himself. And it, at first, I found it. Um, very overwhelming, um, and um, and I it made me all the more um, invested in actually figuring it out um, and and helping other people to um, to be able to engage um, with with uh, economic thought and with Marxist economic thought, um, and and I was particularly also interested. Um, as somebody you know who was raised um, raised female in, in this society, um, you know that um, most of economic thought, including on the left, is really dominated by men and by white men, and a lot of really good white men that I've learned a lot of really good things from. But I was particularly interested in making these ideas more accessible um, to. Um, to people like myself and to others who have been consistently given the message that we um, are not the right people to understand the economy um, in a nutshell. So I spent a bunch of years giving like different talks and stuff like that. Um, and eventually it developed into this idea of, of putting it down in, into words um, and, and getting this, this book out there. And it has been um, a really good and interesting and long process um, of actually making that happen. Um, but, um, but that was the, the motivation for it. It's meant as a book for activists. It's meant as a book for, um, for socialists, for, um, and in particular in this moment where you know, DSA has exploded from you know, a couple thousand to you know, almost a hundred thousand, um, that there's so many new socialists and people that are you know, have the right kind of ideas and instincts, um, but have lots of different, um, you know, variety of different uh, experiences and political, um, political experience and, and what they um, understand as socialism and as Marxism and how to, how to explain capitalism. 
Um, so I, I saw this as a contribution towards, um, towards the movement where we can really kind of deepen um, our theoretical arsenal and kind of uh, get, you know, understand how the system um, works. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but that's the basic, that was my motivation. Um, that and the, the fame and glory and wealth, obviously. Um, so there was another question. Oh, right. So about, um, about financialization. So um, I guess in a nutshell, what I'll say is, you know, so in, in the book, I make the point that financial capital is not something that's new, um, that for as long as capitalism exists, has existed, um, there has been a financial element, right? There's what Marx calls productive capitalists, the people that run the companies where uh, workers produce goods. Um, and then there's um, financial capitalists um, and they are the capitalists that, um, that in help uh, make those investments uh, at a much greater value um, and help the system run much more smoothly um, through the investment of capital. So if you just had, you know, that to go back to that equation, the M to C to M with a doohickey, you know, if every time, so it's a continuous process. It's not just like you have a hundred dollars, you invested in producing things and you get $110 and then you figure out what your next investment is. You have to do it constantly um, in a cycle. Um, and you can't wait until all of your goods have been sold in order to invest more money into the next round of production. Um, if that were to happen, then, you know, production would happen in fits and starts and companies would have to like, you know, keep, have uh, production going and then shut it down until they sold all their goods and then restart it. And um, it would be incredibly um, uh, inefficient um, and would probably lead to a lot of financial ruin actually. And, and, and that's part of what we're seeing actually right now during the pandemic is that when capitalism shuts down even, um, or sections of capital shuts down even temporarily, um, that is incredibly disruptive to the system. Um, and it's not that easy to just close and reopen. Um, and it's also the case that, um, that capitalists need much greater amounts of um, money to invest at different times than what they have on hand. Um, you know, to to invest in, um, you know, a building a new factory or um, you know railroad tracks or uh, building railroads uh, uh, across the country or um, what have you. That you need a lot more capital than an individual capitalist might have. Um, on hand. And so the role of financial capitalist is to help pool basically capital from the, the more broadly the capitalist class and make that accessible to individual capitalists. Um, now the ways that that happens have become much more um, complicated. It's th there's still a lot of, you know, the same basic ideas and principles behind it but there's a lot more complicated financial structures um, than during Marxist time, of course. Um, and the extent to which the, the, the overall strength of financial capital has also increased. Um, but I think the important part to, to, to highlight um, and the part that hasn't changed is that it's not like a new kind of form of creating value that is now like a different stage of capitalism where we no longer need production. Um, because really what, um, um, it's, what happens is you still have that M to C to M prime equation, but just on either end of it, you have an attached um, value going in um, and then the value that ends, that they end up with at the end has to be then split up between um, the productive capitalist and the um, and the uh, financial capitalist in the form of interest. Um, so anyway, um, that 
is probably a little bit hard to explain in a couple minutes time, but hopefully that gives the basic gist. Um, and in the, in the book, I, I have a chapter devoted to it where I explain more in detail, both the history of financial capital and also the specifics of how it operates right now. Awesome, yeah, no, that was um, really clarifying. Um, I see that Sarah was on the stack and then Evan. Yeah, Evan, if you wanna go first, since I already asked a question, you can. No, it's fine, go ahead. We don't need more white male questions. <laughs> So a white woman question instead then. Um, so, I, so I'm wondering actually um, more sort of practically how to, um, how to use your book, I guess, to have um, conversations uh, with self-proclaimed capitalists to try to do some sort of kind of activism and teaching um, because it seems like, you know, someone who's not a billionaire, who's a capitalist probably doesn't quite understand the system either, right? Um, and, and likewise, uh, you know, I'm in academia. And so I think like using this kind of book where everything is broken down really beautifully and, and clearly, if you have any tips for how I might use this um, in, a, in the classroom, like at a, at, a university, at a university setting to kind of teach these sort of basic principles um, and get the kind of get these conversations going um, as, as early as possible. I just ask what what um what do you teach? What are the? Uh, currently, I teach political science, so it's a very I think I mean it's not economy, but it's it's fitting. It's very close, right? Cool. Um, should we get Evan's question on there too, just because of time, and then I can try to take up both. Sure. So I was just going to say, you know, how uh, it's maybe related, but jumping off of that too, like how do you counter like sort of the liberal arguments? about more humane capitalism, such as just increased minimum wage as a solution and things like that, because obviously I think everybody here knows that that's not a solution, but how do you, do you have a, and maybe your book addresses this, um, you know, a better counter argument to that other than, you know, oh, we'll just drive everybody to China, let's say. <laughs> mm -hmm. Great, yeah, great questions. Um, well, I guess one thing that I will say that sort of connects the two about a more humane capitalism. Well, first of all, I would say <coughs> when I, I said this, I guess earlier about like the $15 minimum wage and stuff like that, you know, is that obviously we should be all about it. Um, that even, even if we understand that it's not enough um, and that, you know, ultimately capitalism can't be made humane, we should um, definitely fight for for the money because um, we need it and because it'll make it easier actually to organize and because it helps to um, bring more people into the struggle um, because it's really, you know, uh, it's really hard to imagine overturning the entire system when you can't even, w you know, win um, a increase to your wages. Like you have to have the experience um, of going through those struggles in order to be able to fight for more. Um, so I think, you know, we need to be all about it. Um, but I think in terms of like a more humane capitalism, and I think, you know, this also kind of relates to the question of talking to capitalists. <coughs> um, sorry. I'm guessing that most of the like, insofar as any of us have capitalists in our lives, um, they're probably like small, small time capitalists. Um, I, I don't think we have the ear of um, big capitalists. Um, I think that, um, you know, and small business owners are kind of under the pressure of both where um, they're under the pressure of competition and they're also under the pressure of often exploiting themselves um, and sometimes exploiting a few other people. Um, but I think by and large, the part of the point that I try to make in the book is that capitalists are, are cogs in the system, you know, that they, it's not about what individual capitalists, like whether they're well-meaning or not, um, you know, it's, it's about this unrelenting process of competition that capitalists can't opt out of. I mean, the only way to opt out of it is to not be a capitalist. Um, 
but as long as you keep, want to keep, um, uh, as long as you want to stay in business, you have to do it by um, expanding your market share, uh, by not falling behind on the competitive struggle for more advanced and labor-saving technologies, by being able to sell your goods more cheaply than your competitor. And the only way to do that um, is to drive down you know, labor costs by and large. Um, so there isn't really, <clears throat> it's not about individual capitalists and what they are, um, you know, what they, what they understand or don't understand um, and how good or bad they are as, you know, moral human beings. Um, I th ultimately, what it's about is, is about organizing our side, you know, to fight to fight against their interests, you know, that actually a $15 minimum wage is against the interests of capitalists, um, you know, and that's, and, to, and that we have to understand that in order to be able to wage that fight. Um, <clears throat> you know, and the same thing goes for things like, um, you know, ecological sustainability, um, that it's actually not in the interest of individual capitalists um, because they have to always be in, they have to always be um, on, uh, on the, you know, they, they have to always be looking out for their short term profits um, in order to stay competitive. Um, even if that means that in the long term, um, it means that none of us, including them, have a planet to live on, they are constantly driven by this process to make things as easily and as cheaply as possible, you know? So like, um, I, one of the examples I use in my book is like the Toyota, um, wait, was it, no, no, it wasn't Toyota, it was Volkswagen. Anyway, um, that had their whole like marketing um, PR strategy was around how they were like the cleanest thing since like riding your bike. Um, but then it turned out that they had, they were, were just using technology that cheats um, that cheats when it's get when it gets tested on how on, on emissions, um, and that's because it costs more to actually have cleaner technology than it does to have you know um, technology that cheats the system. Um, and um, so anyway, um, I, I think that's really the heart of the argument is that it's not about individual capitalists and what they understand and don't understand. Um, it's about a system that drives all of capitalists to short term profits um, in order to stay uh, in the game. Um, and so rather than appealing to their moral senses or to um, incentivize them, um, we have to fight them, regulate them, um, et cetera. Um, I feel like there was one other part of that question. Um, oh, about using the book in an academic setting. To be honest, um, I'm, I'll be very interested about it to hear from, I know that some professors um, are starting to use it um, and I'll be interested to hear how that goes and what is um, useful and, and not. Um, I, the book just came out a couple of months ago. So uh, we'll, we'll see what are good, you know, best practices that come out of that. Um, I, I do think, you know, it's um, because it is written to be as accessible as possible. Um, I think it's a good, it's a good place um, to go for, um, you know, including um, introductory, uh, you know, poli sci or whatever other classes um, where people can kind of get their, their, um, their, their, sink their teeth into something. Um, you know, I think it would be great. I think each chapter is sort of like um, it's its own unit in terms of um, the ideas that um, that I try to explain in every chapter, um, and could probably benefit from you know there being uh, key concepts um, and questions. Um, that are pulled out for each chapter. I do have like in the book, a glossary and, an, and, and the, the, the key concepts in each chapter are in small caps so that they can kind of be pulled out. Um, but I think centering discussions on, you know, um, 
pulling out those key concepts, drawing out uh, questions for each chapter, um, I think will will probably be effective. But I'll, I'm I'm eager to hear how it goes and what works um, and doesn't work for for different teachers. And I guess yeah. I guess we're at, we're we're close to time, so maybe if there's a, a final question, but otherwise, um, that's probably where we're at. Well, I have one question too. Unless anyone wants to bring up anything, um, yeah, just quoting from the book. Uh, you have the final chapter talking about the pandemic and how this is like I think you said going to the presses around the same time, but. Um, there's like one quote you said, like uh, the heavily indebted corporations, the frayed global trade system, and millions of struggling families will not easily weather the severe shocks to supply, demand, production, and employment. And and in your final chapter, like you're you're sort of saying like, but here like supply chains have also been severely broken. Again, like back to like what you were saying earlier about capitalists also having to endure weirdly enough the the nonsense of capitalism in some ways. Um, I was just wondering if there's anything you wanted to like extend from that chapter since we are like a few more months in to the pandemic about what you think, I know it's a really big question, but about maybe what do you think is going to, what capitalism is going to look like? Because because I think for a lot of us, I, I read that chapter and I was thinking like that's, yeah, like it's not like so easy that capitalists are just going to regroup. There are fundamental things that have happened to their system Mm -hmm. But then again, like the way you wrote that line and why I like it so much, it's, it's like you're not also assuming, therefore, things are just going to work out. It goes back to the question of organizing, you know, like, you know, all of them together sort of suffering. Obviously, the families matter most. But I was wondering if you wanted to, like, elaborate more on that um, for the last question, maybe. That's, you know, unless anyone else had anything to say. But that's something that was on my mind reading the book. Great. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I mean, I think... Um, you know, one of the points that I was trying to make there is that the the state of the economy before the pandemic hit was not um, was not healthy as it was, um, and I don't just mean that in the sense of like capitalism is never healthy because it is built on our exploitation, um, but that we were like on the downward trend towards a recession. Um, and that, um, and that the extent to which things were humming along, um, you know, the extent to which we had a, a quote unquote recovery since the last re recession 10 years ago, the great recession, um, was on like the weakest possible basis, um, that there were already like massive contradictions, um, before the pandemic even hit. Um, and, and Part of the reason that that's important to say is that, you know, had we been, had the economy been in better shape and had our uh, social safety net been in better shape, um, well, we have barely any social safety net at all in this country, then you could possibly see a scenario. It would be very difficult, you know, given the, um, as you said, the, just the shock to supply chains um, and the shock to demand um, you know, businesses shuttering, tens of millions of people going, getting unemployed. Um, in the, in a in the most ideal scenario, in a best possible um, scenario, where you um, where that happens, but the economy had been in healthier shape, and our social safety net had been in better shape, and our public hospitals um, were able to um, actually withstand a pandemic. Um, where we had a, you know, uh, a government that actually managed um, the pandemic uh, in the way that some other countries have been able to do um, through, um, you know, really shutting down the economy and then um, uh, test heavily testing, tracing, contact tracing, etc. Um, in the best possible scenario, then, you know, it would be hard, but you could see a, a, a situation where the economy can slowly recover um, from having, you know, been uh, suffering such a, an unprecedented blow to both supply and demand um, that that we witnessed um, through the pandemic. 
Um, but instead, that has happened in the context of um, the economy uh, not being in, in good shape and um, our social safety net being barely existing. Um, and, and in that context, um, it will take an extremely long time um, for there to be a rebound. And, and there will be a rebound for some parts. I mean, there are already obviously there's, you know, um, sections, you know, the billionaires that I've mentioned that have increased their wealth during the pandemic. There are some companies that are doing quite well. Um, but in terms, of the, in terms of the overall economic health and in terms of how things are going for the majority of people, um, that is gonna be a long struggle. And what I anticipate, unfortunately, um, is that given um, the cratering out of, um, of state budgets um, um, in particular um, through this crisis that um, we're gonna have just, uh, we are gonna have years of fighting against uh, austerity measures. Um, and um, you know, that basically all state, the, the reason that there's been such a rush to reopen states um, to begin with is not because, um, is not even really about this like culture war um, that Trump has helped to stoke, but because states uh, need revenue um, for, for their budgets. Um, there's, there's also the culture war part of it that is being um, uh, manipulated, but, but that's why like here in, in New York where I live, where we have a liberal uh, mayor and a liberal governor, um, you know, they've in insisted on uh, reopening schools despite um, the wishes of teachers and the wishes of the majority of families um, because the uh, New York City and New York State budgets are, are cratering. Um, and that's really what's behind it. Um, so I think, I think for us, it's like having that framework in mind that we understand, you know, that they're, they're coming for us, that the budgets are um, in, 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 in bad shape and will continue to be in bad shape and that their, their solution to that will be um, more and more austerity. Um, I think on the, on the flip side of it, um, and, and I'll, I'll end there, is that we do have, you know, and I, I started off my presentation talking about the way that everything is being exposed right now, you know, that these kind of discussions are happening not just among DSA members, but they're happening everywhere. That people are trying to figure out, um, you know, what is wrong with this society that we live in. Um, that everything is is being opened up and exposed, um, and that we have a real opportunity as socialists and as people on the left to actually put forward a different kind of a vision and raise much bigger questions. And have been raised in a really long time. Um, you know, the, in, in, the, con the contradiction of this moment is that while on the one hand there's a lot of like bleak things happening, um, the left is actually never hasn't been stronger in you know than it has for, for decades. Um, and, and that's an, a really important um, point I think for us to focus on. Um, we actually have the ability to not just fight for you know the scraps at the bottom, but we have the potential right now to open up much bigger questions and to put forward a, a like much deeper uh, and wider uh, vision for, for how uh, society should be run and how to address the questions um, and, the, and the challenges that we're facing. Um, you know, we have the opportunity right now to talk about things like nationalizing the oil industry and <clears throat> talk about the need for a national healthcare system and you know, those kind of things and to talk much and to talk openly um, about, you know, about a profit system and about, you know, essential, a profit system that calls workers essential, but then, um, you know, uh, uh, treats them like garbage. Um, we have, um, you know, I think within that context, actually a lot of opportunities for the left um, to grow. Um, yeah, so that, I guess I'll, I will end there. I don't know if, um, Anything well, else? Yeah, if there's anyone have any one last question. I just wanted to say really again, just thank you so much for writing this book. It really was like you know I'm also in the, like I said in political science and 
um, that field, I think Sarah could say, like, could, you know, um, agree with. It's like a fairly, like, you know, people say academia is left, but that's hilarious. Like, it's mostly liberal slash conservative, and they agree on a lot of things, actually. It's more like civility and all that kind of weird stuff. But, you know, I've, I've been looking for a book where I can actually understand. I've tried to read other economic books. I'm trying to learn, but definitely I feel like this book um, helped me see a lot of things that I was really missing from my own perspective. So I really thank you for writing this. I'm def we're definitely going to be using this book in our chapter for a while. Um, and like Sarah said, I, you know, depending on like the classes I'm teaching, I'm definitely going to use that for the teaching classes I teach. But yeah, it's very grateful for your time. Very grateful for the research you did for this. Um, and yeah, just overall, really thank you. Um, and thank you to everybody for attending this. Yeah, thank you so much, Sudeep. And thanks to all of you guys. It's really a pleasure to get to talk to all of you. And, um, I, I hope we get to, uh, we'll, our, our paths will cross again. Good luck with, with all of the organizing. For sure. And if there's any other projects or anything that you want to facilitate on, just let us know. We're always looking for more wisdom and insight. Um, and so, yeah, we just really, really look forward to hearing from you again. Awesome. That sounds great. I just want to say before you go, also, um, I thought that your made it really um, sort of I guess outlined an easier way to have a discussion about how the disability community plays into capitalism and how capitalism and the disability community are sort of very interrelated um, and depend on, like capitalism really relies on that there is a disabled community um, in order to function. Mm -hmm. And then having those kinds of conversations with people though, when you're talking about uh, you know, cross organizing and um, uh, just sort of like solidarity um, in activism, uh, it's made it a lot easier to sort of use the writing that you did to have those conversations. Um, I'm not very uh, great at putting together. I'm still sort of like learning this too from, as you said, you were an activist and sort of did all this research yourself to write your book. Um, that's sort of where I'm coming from too. And um, yeah, it's just, it's a, it's a whole learning curve to sort of have these conversations with people, especially with people that support capitalism um, or just don't really understand the, the links that the different, um, I guess, call them minority groups have and how they're, you know, organized um, in a capitalist system. But having that conversation about disability community, um, I think a lot of it comes down to the financial side of um, uh, capitalism rather than the production side of capitalism because most disabled people are left out of the production side of capitalism and we sort of fuel the financial side more than anything else. Um, and I think your delineation of those two um, components of capitalism made that a lot easier um, to talk about. So I thought that that was uh, just sort of like really great groundwork. Um, so I'm just, I just, I guess, said all that to say thank you um, for your work. I think it was uh, really helpful for a lot of us. Awesome, thank you so much.